lecture which marks the inauguration of a visiting scholars program entitled the Mervyn Smith Memorial Lecture, established in honor of the late Mervyn Smith, esteemed chairman of the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation. This lecture program will enable the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation to invite a leading scholar to speak and conduct workshops in the three Holocaust centers in South Africa. When the late Mervyn Smith was passed away and I was attending prayers, Paul Smith, who is not with us here this evening, came up to me and he said, you know, I haven't talked to my siblings yet, but we, we want to do something to honor our father. And indeed, that is what has happened. And so this whole program is generously sponsored by the Smith family. And I'm very honored that Abigail and Debbie and Rachel and their families, children, are all here this evening. Uh, and really, for us, that is really a great tribute to our work and, of course, to them. So thank you for being with us. Mervyn Smith, community giant, mentor, friend, and the voice of reason. Mervyn's contribution to the Jewish community of South Africa and international Jewish community are well known. He dedicated his life to fighting injustice in all its forms and champion, championing human rights. And in this way, he made a profound impact on the community, the Jewish community, but especially on the broader community of South Africa. His great intellect, knowledge of the law, his wisdom and guidance were invaluable to the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation in its national role and in its place in the international arena of Holocaust organizations. He served for many years as a representative of the South African Jewish Board of Deputies to the Conference on Jewish Bank against Germany in New York. And I'm very pleased this evening to welcome Advocate Michael Donan, who has taken over that role, and we're very grateful to have somebody of his caliber following in the footsteps. Thank you. In, in his work in New York, in his representing us in New York, he championed the work of the Holocaust centers in South Africa. He had an abiding interest in and extensive knowledge of anti-Semitism and Holocaust history, and profoundly understood the importance of Holocaust education and remembrance in the South African context. He formed and chaired the African and its president, Bogue, and as its president, Bogue, the establishment of the Bogue Bassam Jewish Detainees Memorial and Information Center in Mauritius, which opened shortly before he passed away. He often said that the story of the refugees of Nazi Europe interned by the British on Mauritius after they tried to flee Palestine, flee to Palestine, was the closest the Holocaust came to South Africa. Mervyn had a very special regard for Holocaust survivors and was deeply committed to them uh, in his support for them and for Shiori Tafleta. He would have been honored to know that Ella Blumenthal and Miriam Lichterman are with us this evening. And we are honored that you are here too. Thank you. When I was, um, <laughs> I was looking for a DVD today, this is not in my speech, but I have to share this with you because there's nothing like synchronicity. Um, and I was looking for a DVD which we need for, for uh, January and somewhere in that office of mine. And I came across an old edition of Jewish Affairs. And I don't know what made me do it, but I opened it up. And the first thing I turned to was an article written by Merlin, Hate Speech, the South African Jewish Board of Deputies of the South African Constitution. Now, I know that he did a lot of work in the 786 uh, radio case um, hate speech case, and I just went through the exit this quickly this thing, and I was astonished to find something which is completely opposite to the scene. Because if some of you wandered into the main part of the exit of our center to the main doors, you would have seen on the left 
but there's a brand new exhibition which went up today. And it is an exhibition about a woman called Eva Schloss. And Eva Schloss played a very important role in this particular court case. And Mervyn refers to her in this piece that he wrote. And in fact, it's such an intersection of his world that I would just like to read it to you. Eventually, the matter has come to be heard before a tribunal, constituted by the World Cross Monitoring and Complaints Commission of South Africa. By the way, he drove this whole case. The tribunal commenced its hearings in Cape Town in December last year, and will be continued in March 2014. Thus far at the hearing, the South African Jewish Board of Deputies has called as witnesses to two eminent academics, one a sociologist and another an historian, as well as a very eminent South African rabbi, and most importantly, the evidence of Hiva Schloss, an Auschwitz survivor and a stepsister of Anna Frank. I must say her evidence was riveting. The defense of the radio station, which for many years was not revealed to us, their opposition was always based on procedure rather than substance, now reveals itself as based on the right to freedom of expression which you may understand freedom of speech and the denial that the above extracts constitute hate speech. And what were those extracts? And I'll just read one from you. International jury declared war on Germany, threw South Africa unwillingly into the hands of the Jews, and thus the Oppenheimers became the real directors of South Africa's foreign policy. Mervyn, with his courage, his ability to stand up for injustice faced this head on and he drove the initiative of the Jewish community, which in the end was successful and which resulted in an apology and a retraction. So we couldn't have hoped for a better result. And Urban was responsible for that. Dr. Samuel Kassar, one of the world's leading scholars, scholars on the Holocaust and the Jews of Greater Poland, will be delivering tonight's lecture entitled Vilna, the Capital of the Lithuans. Lithuania was particularly close to Mervyn's heart, and thus in consultation with the family, we felt that it was fitting that the focus of tonight's lecture reflects that great interest. The board of trustees of the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation joined me in thanking the family for what made it possible to establish this lecture series as the most appropriate memorial of the market. Mervyn's ideals and vision remain a lasting legacy. Before I introduce Dr. Kassoff more fully, it gives me great pleasure to ask Rachel Smith, Mervyn's son, to address you. Well, first of all, I just want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. It's really wonderful to see everyone here. I know it's going to be a fantastic lecture. Richard, of course, has spoken about my father as a communal leader, and that's, you know, I can't add to that other than to say, go here, here, and one day if you all want to sit down with me for coffee, I'll tell you much more. Uh, as Richard mentioned, we, we, we spoke about the various topics to discuss, and one of the things we settled on was, I mean, I, I pushed for my family with was to connect this talk somehow to the story of the Lithuania, the story of Lithuania. And the reason for that is, from a very personal angle, my dad was born in 1937. So for him, the Holocaust wasn't something that he read about in books or learned about at school. It was an actual event that took place in his lifetime. In 1945, when the war ended and the news came out, he was a young boy of eight, and the news was more than news. And that's what I want to emphasize. It was the story of his family that had been left behind. Not just his, of course, but most of the South African Jewish community's family. And Lithuania, equally, was not just a place that he read about in books. It was a place that he heard about in countless stories and countless people that he met who were in his own community. His friends, his family, his grandparents, his father. And the point about that, for me, is that, of course, this is history of the most important time. And, of course, we have wonderful scholars who study the history, who study the books. But what many of us, 
I wouldn't say forget, but sometimes overlook perhaps, is how deeply personal that connection is to us as South African Jews. Because the nature of immigration sometimes is to take on the new culture and forget the old, particularly when one looks at the history of Yiddish in this country and how to a very large extent disappeared as a spoken language for various reasons, some of them quite controversial. It sort of became absent in a lot of people's minds, not for my dad. My dad was a real place and we spoke about it a lot as a real place that, of course, is no longer a center of Jewish communal life, but in its day was, as Dr. Kessler will no doubt talk more than anything, than I can, you know, one of the great centers of Jewish life. And that's what it's all about. That's the personal connection for me and for my family. So with that in mind, I hope you enjoyed the talk. And thank you very much for coming. I think it's particularly fitting this evening that we have Dr. Kassoff with us. Because, like Rachel speaking about Mervyn, Dr. Kassoff's connection to Lithuania is deeply personal. He's one of the world's leading scholars on the Holocaust and the Jews of Greater Poland. And he is the Northern Professor of History at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. He's recognized as a leading scholar on the Holocaust, the interwar period, and the Jews of Eastern Europe. He was born in a displaced persons camp in Stuttgart, Germany, and grew up speaking Yiddish as his first language. His mother survived because in the first instance, a classmate hit her and her sister until they were betrayed. <coughs> they then ended up in the resistance movement and whilst his father was arrested by the Russians and spent the duration of the war in a Soviet prison camp. He holds an MSc from the London School of Economics and earned a PhD in 1976 from Princeton University with the study of students, professors, and students in Stavros, Russia, which was published by the University of California Press in 1989. He's widely known for his book, Who Will Write Our History? Emanuel Rindelblum, The Warsaw Ghetto and the Odeg Shabbos Archive, which was published by Indiana University Press in 2007, and for which he received the 2007 August Prize of the American Association in Advancement of Slavic Studies. He was also a finalist for the 2008 National Jewish Book Award. The film of the book is presently in development as a major documentary film produced incidentally by Nancy Spielberg, who was a recent visitor to Cape Town, if any of you will remember. Dr. Kassoff is one of the lead historians and content curators of Poland, Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw, Poland, which opened in October 2014. He was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Jewish Research, has won numerous awards, and has been visiting professor on many campuses across the world he was lectured by him. Some of you may have had the privilege to listen to him last year when he visited Cape Town in private capacity, but agreed to speak uh, on his experiences with the Polish Museum. His research, teaching, and writing covers a wide spectrum, which includes modern Jewish history, Russian and Soviet history, the Holocaust, modern German history, modern European history, and modern European intellectual history. Much of his work has been translated, and he himself has a command of five languages. And I was listening to him to speaking Polish this evening, and Yiddish this evening, and English, fortunately for us, most of us. Um, but he also speaks Hebrew and has a good command um, uh, of Russian. In addition to his many articles and reviews, his more recent and current major publications include the rewriting and expansion of the book first published by Nibo in 2004, Distinctive Life of East European Jury, which will appear in Polish. As I to get to Polish. Soon. Soon, soon. And then, uh, 2015, the ghetto reportage of Peretz Kovacinski and Joseph Zelkovitz, which he edited uh, and published by Yale University uh, last, uh, last year. 
In this, this year, um, the Posen anthology of modern Jewish culture um, was also uh, edited together with David Roski, also published by Yale. So it is indeed a great pleasure to visit, to have such a distinguished first um, scholar in this series, and very much look forward to his address this evening, Vilna, the capital of the Republic. Well, thank you for those kind remarks, and uh, it's a real honor to be here to be invited to give the first Murphy Smith Memorial Lecture, and uh, I can hope I'll be able to explain how this ethos of communal leadership and community dedication is so specific and such an integral part of the Yiddish Arita of Jewish Lithuania. Uh, I grew up, when I was little, I kind of thought that I was a donor. Because I knew the thing for donor was it was the real deal. And the uh, and we were supposed to look down on other higher ships, the Alexander, not to mention the Gaddish And I remember when I was little, there would be reunions of uh, the Vilna Artisans in New York. There was an organization called Versailles Vilna, and my mother was in these artisans <laughs> in the store for Vilna, and sometimes my parents took me to those reunions. I didn't attend, but I'd be up somewhere in the corner. But then, as I got older, I realized that it was all a bluff. I wasn't really a Vilna. My parents came from little towns near them. It wasn't the real thing. <laughs> and the Romans used to call us Odishtam the Kunstet of Achayas, retarded small show of uh, hicks. Uh, but somehow I, came, I got over my town places. And uh, I'm here today to try to say something about this extraordinary city. And, uh, I want to begin by playing you a, a bit of a song that was composed in Dome in 1935. And that's a pian to Jewish story. Vilna Stott von Geist und Pienes, Vilna Jerusalem. Vilna, city of spirit and sincerity. Vilna sunk in Jewish thought. And then there's the refrain. Vilna, our hometown, our longing and desire. How often the name brings a tear to my eyes. So let's see if I can put up with the technology. Uh, this is always difficult for you. <laughs> I'm going to shut this off. <laughs> and uh, it, because um, I can't figure out why this went on, I'd love to see you a little bit of uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> something. I'm not going to do it. Bill, you're still doing this. Bill, you're still doing this. Bill, you're still doing this. You are small, but it's still a few ways to do this. We just came back now. What wrong is there if you're in trouble? And thanks to me for being a man. Und die Alter, die Ungar, die Slut, die Langer, die Gushari, and then the refrain is, die Ungar, 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 for some reason, uh, Beethoven is a uh, opus uh, <laughs> uh, So I learned a uh, lesson. In uh, 1944, uh, just after the liberation, are you all able to hear me? In 1944, just after the liberation of the Lily Ghetto, a great Yiddish poet, Albert Sitzgerber, 
when looking for uh, books or documents that he hidden from the Germans in the ghetto. And he was thinking of the various hiding places that he had prepared. And he pulled out the crumpled diary of Zelie Kalmanovich, who had been a leading intellectual in Jewish been a, a director, a deputy director of the Yivo Yiddish Scientific Institute, uh, who had been deported to a German concentration camp in Estonia, where he was shot in 1944. Uh, his only son, Sholem Luria, had managed to get to the Hebrew University before the war, and he went on to have a great academic career in Israel. And people remembered that as the Germans were taking Kalmanovich out to be shot, he yelled at them, I have a son who was here. But this diary, uh, written by Zelda Kalmanovich, and which has never been translated into English, has one passage that I want to cite for you. In June 1942, Kalmanovich writes the following, Vilna was the capital of the Jewish diaspora. Its destruction will force the Jewish people to finally let go of the diaspora and fight for a future in Israel. Now, the question is, why would Kalmanovich call Vilna the capital of the Jewish diaspora? Yes, before World War I, it was an important town, a railroad <coughs> junction, an economic center, an important educational center, the center of Jewish publishing. We know all that. But after World War I, the city fell on hard times. It lost its Russian markets. It became a small provincial city of 60,000 Jews, less than half the population. Uh, so why didn't Kalmanovich mention mighty Warsaw, which had six times more Jews, or Lodz, with five times more, more Jews? A lot of people say, why didn't you say Hooch? In Yiddish, it's uh, why not New York, which was the capital of the Jewish press and of the Jewish theater? But what made the building so important, and the reason why I think Kalmanovich was right, was Vilna's role as a model. Its unique ability to fashion a Jewish civil society, a sense of community that functioned as a kind of a moral compass for the entire diaspora. In the words of Max Weimar, who was the director of the Yiddish Scientific Institute, Vilna possessed, and I quote him directly now, the genius of place, the genius of place, a fusion of physical landscape and collective and uh, collective memory. Uh, each building carried a message. Each building, you might say, carried that unique Vilna fusion, that unique Vilna synthesis of tradition and modernity. For example, the great Jewish library in the building, the Strashun building, the Strashun library, endowed by Matthias Yavn Strashun in the 19th century. It was a library where uh, on each bench two people would sit. And if you went into the Strasun Library, you would often see a well-known communist sitting next to a well-known rabbi or a well-known yeshiva book. And the Jewish communist might be reading a Hebrew book. And the yeshiva buffer might well be reading Marx. And one Polish refugee who arrived in Vilna in 1940 and had never been to Jewish Lithuania before said, oh my God, here in Vilna, even the Jewish communists are more Jewish than the rabbis back in Flitzwabe. <laughs> in Vilna, Jewry had a collective memory, and it was a collective memory that had room for totally different heroes side by side. One, of course, the basic hero was the Vilna Gaon, Rabbi Eliyahu, the Grah, the famous Vilna Gaon, 
who lived from 1720 to 1797. I know, by the way, that there are many, I've met many, many Jews in the course of my life who say they're direct descendants of the Roman <laughs> God, and for 799, they produce a delicious tree, a family tree. Years ago, in Connecticut, there was this uh, doctor who came up, and this is a digression. So, the Jewish doctor came up and says, you know, my family is descendants from the Roman God. And uh, my uh, grandfather was a great Talmud established back in Europe, and uh, I found this hit, this, this batch of Yiddish letters, and I'm sure they were kind of burning, and I'm sure they were kind of shivas, but uh, can you tell me what they're about? And so I look at them, and it's from a young woman, you SOB, you left me high and dry. But for America, you said you'd send for me, baby. But so we have to Rashi says that Jacob left their shadow. Rashi says, why does the Hanach say he left their shadow? And if you say Jacob left, because the great man needs a place to store me this. And this is the, so this is your grandfather who was sort of this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, the building of God. Uh, had an enormous impact on the memory of Vilna Jews. Vilna uh, Jews like to say that when the Vilna Don lived in Vilna in the 18th century, there were no fewer than, this is the legend, there were no fewer than 333 Jews who knew the town of Taibart. So in other words, if you can make it in Vilna, you can make it anywhere. <laughs> anywhere. This is what it means to be a goal. The competition is very great. Vilna Jews also like to say about the goal that uh, a child would run after the Vilna goal as he was walking through the streets. And he would yell, the Vilna goal, the Vilna goal, let's get there. The Vilna God is, is, is uh, walking, and the Vilna God will turn to the child and say, Vilna, Vilna, if you want it badly enough, you can be a God too, you can be a genius too. And the Vilna Jews, in their customary modesty, like to say that Vilna, if you want it badly enough, is Vilna. And what it means is this lip uh, tenacity this lift off determination to reach the goal, to work hard no matter what. Uh, and it was this notion of the spirit of the building goal that was internalized by all building Jews. This premium on, if I could uh, paraphrase uh, a building uh, historian, this premium on to the gain that this made them say to grasp something with your own mind with your own reason. Use your own intellectual resources and effort. You don't need a Hasidic Rebbe to help you. You don't need a life coach. You could do it on your own. We certainly see this in the intellectual trajectory of Lithuanian Jewry. The Vilna Gaon's successor, you might say, is Chaim of Balazhi, who founded the Balazhi Yeshiva, which in turn became the model of the Litvish Yeshivas, which spread that spirit throughout the Jewish world. There's a story, I'm not sure it's true, that once when people were singing Sholem Aleichem on Shabbos, Chaim of Abortion actually says, you know, why do we really need all these angels? I mean, we can get along without the angels. What's that the Smalachim you can get in But again, that might just be a story that certainly shows you this individuality. <coughs> Another pillar of Vilna's collective memory Again, it was very, very strong, was the Garrett Setting or, or the Righteous Conduct. The Garrett Setting, this is a legend, some scholars say it's not true, but scholars are always too true. But the Garrett Setting was a Polish nobleman named Valentin Patowski who converted to Judaism in the 1740s. And that was a capital crime in Poland to convert to Judaism. And then he was caught and burned at the stake. He was denounced by a Jewish tailor. And generations afterwards, the family of that tailor reminded that their ancestor had been a snitch. So 
so he was burdened at the stake. But the uh, legend had it that a uh, courageous Jew stole the uh, ashes from the stake and buried them in the Jewish cemetery. And an oak tree began to grow near the grave. When the mill was gone, died in 1797, he was buried next to the very center. And over time, this oak tree began to grow a, a branches that resembled the outstretched arms of the human being. It was a big, big tree. And Jews would come to the tree to pray. In a time of trouble, they would come to the tree to, to commune with God and to pray for it survival. And the legend was that as long as that tree stood, the Jews of Dona would survive. And indeed, as the wave of pogrom swept through Ukraine in the eighteen eighties, as a terrible and worse wave of pogrom swept through South Russia in 1905, 1906, Dona was spared pogrom. And now fast forward to July 4th, 1941 the second week of the German occupation of Vilna. And we read in the diary of Hermann of Hook, the librarian of the Vilna ghetto, that one of the great uh, leaders of Vilna Jewry, Dr. Gershuni, is opening a meeting, and he's assembled the cream of the Vilna Jewish intelligentsia. And he says, for centuries, we believe that in the Zahus, in the merit, of the Vilna Gaon and the Gerd Sedek, Vilna would be spared. But, and again, I just want to add, in 1935, the Polish Hooligans cut down the tree. But our luck has now run out. And the Germans have ordered us to form the Judenrat, the Jewish Council, and you around the table have the moral obligation to join this union. A few weeks later, the entire Judenrat was murdered. And that shows that uh, some of the happenstance of the Holocaust, Kovna, which was a town very close to Vilna, had a Udrop that was chosen by the Jews themselves and included the most respected leaders of the Jewish community. Whereas in nearby Vilna, the Jewish leadership was largely destroyed in the first months of the German occupation, and it would have a very big experience during the war. What are some other pillars of this collective memory? There was a woman in the 19th century called Boyera Esther. And she was a saintly woman who founded a cult of charity. And this began a long Vilna tradition of involving women in all the business of the community. In the elections for the Jewish community in 1918, the first democratic elections ever held in Vilna's history, now the Russian Empire was finished, women were given the right to vote. This was unheard of in Eastern Europe, but in Vilna it was regarded as a matter of course. And in interwar Vilna, women played an important role in the community. The boom was led by Honor Rosenthal, and one of the most important schools in the city was led by Sophia Another pillar of collective memory, the legendary rabbi Israel Salant, who founded the Musa movement, the movement which emphasized the importance of achieving ethical improvement by fighting with your own inner being, and that it's up to you to do so. And Israel Salanta, who founded the Musa movement, was a rabbi in Vilna during a cholera epidemic in the 1840s. And the legend says that as the cholera was raging, on Yom Kippur, he got up out of the pulpit and ate. And he, by so doing, he reminded Jews that the highest value in Judaism was life itself. And that during the play, you take care of your health before you fast. Vilna's collective memory also had room for fools and for uh, media. There was uh, Mokhet Chabad, 
who was this uh, pathetic little character who could never get along with his wife, and he and his wife were always fighting. And then his wife passed away, and uh, the legend goes that at the funeral, Lutkin wept bitter tears, but he wept and wept and wept. And the shamus finally says, a, a, a Jew shouldn't cry so much at a funeral. She blames Gomish in Chiyas Hamesim. Don't you believe in the resurrection of the dead? And Moshe answered, Ich became the first great hero of the book. Uh, thanks to Hirschka Lecker, the book was able to begin its saga, its story, its myth of Jewish dignity, Jewish readiness to fight for honor and, 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 and the revolution. In 1902, in a May Day demonstration, in Vilna, the Russians arrested Polish and Jewish workers and they sent them to prison. And the governor ordered only the Jewish workers to Not the Polish workers, but the Jewish workers. The Hirsch and Leiker, the shoemaker, took a pistol, went into the, Polish, the Russian governor's office, and shot him. Didn't kill him, uh, but tried to kill him. And he was sentenced to hand. He refused to pray to the rat. He went to the gallows without the rabbi. And this caused the sensation that a Jew from the lowest social class could die like a human. A Jew from the lowest social class could show sublime courage. And what's amazing is that the Jewish middle class, the Balabatim, the Shemim, the religious Jews, who ordinarily would have had nothing but contempt for the Jewish understood that he was one of theirs. And so modern building, the Dona of the 20s and 30s, was a city that had in its collective conscience the Dona gone on one hand and Hirschka Lecter on the other, and both deserved an enormous degree of respect. The fusion of tradition and modernity in Jewish Dome was epitomized by the physical layout of the city. There was a kind of a creative tension between three rings of Jewish settlement in Dome. The first ring was the oldest part of the Jewish city, the uh, uh, old Jewish quarter with the synagogue court. And then around that old neighborhood were the more modern and luxurious buildings built in the 19th century where the Jewish middle classes lived. And then surrounding buildings, like little pearls, were Jewish neighborhoods like the uh, and Antico, which were like little shuttles. And uh, these neighborhoods were not so far away that a Jew would not be able to walk to the center of the city within half an hour. But the symbolic part of Jewish building was the shulman, where the great synagogue was built in the late 16th century. From the outside, it didn't look that impressive. Because in keeping the Polish law, you couldn't build a shul that was higher than the surrounding churches. So what the Jews did was that they built the shul deep, deep underground. So from the outside, it didn't look that great. But as you entered, you descended many steps. So then you walked in 
and there was a site that took your breath away. And it was said, of course, this is a legend, but it was said that when Napoleon entered the film show in 1812, he explained, yes, this is indeed the Jerusalem of Lithuania. Now, the Jews have many legends about the old Vilna Shul. One legend was that when the Jews had finished building the Shul, the Karyats, an, 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 an old sect, an old tribe, who lived uh, in great numbers near Vilna, and who still had their synagogue in a truck, because that's another story. The Karyats appeared and said, and over the peace. The synagogue belongs to us, not to you, because we are the real Jew, not you. The Jews told them to get lost, and the Karyites then went to Rajivil, the Polish governor, and uh, I guess a distant relative by marriage to Jackie Kennedy. Uh, and so there was a uh, there was a uh, trial, and as they came to Rajivil's house, the Karyites took off their shoes and left them in the front hall. The Jewish community sent a uh, Stadler, an intercessor, to, to argue their case. But instead of leaving his shoes in the front hall, he tied his shoes and hung them around his neck. And he goes in with his shoes hanging around his neck. And the Karyites say, Rajivil says, what are you coming in with your shoes around your neck for? And the Jew answers, well, you know, when Moses went up to Har Sinai, to Mount Sinai, to get the Torah, he left his shoes at the foot of the mountain. And a carrier came and stole them, and ripped them off, so I'm scared. If I leave my shoes in the front hall, the Karyites will take them, I'll never see them again. And the Karyites had a good laugh. He said in front of Rajivil to the Jew, you idiot, what are you talking about? When Moses was on Mount Sinai, there were no Karyites yet. <laughs> and the smart bill, the Jew turned to the pole and said, you see, if that's so, then how can the Karyites say they are the true Jews? And that's how the Jews got to keep the building. So they said, it's in his, And if you want to read about the shut uh, Shul. And I'm sure my time uh, throughout it has written some beautiful stories about that, which have been translated to me. He insisted on the two great writers who supplied the word was written about film. In his memoirs, Shmari 11, a Zionist leader, wrote, I could wander for hours in that ancient synagogue court, in that ancient courtyard. That feeling, I suppose, and I'm still quoting, comes over a sensitive Englishman when he wanders among the colleges and courses of Oxford. The Vilna Synagogue courtyard is the Oxford of the people in exile, and its study rooms were its colleges. Now, when I was at Oxford in the late 60s, I naturally thought, ah, I'm in the building of England. <laughs> the uh, Nazis turned the structure into a stable but it survived the war. It was blown up by the Soviets. For reasons of geography and history, Vilna entered the interwar period as the only major Jewish city in Eastern Europe where the <coughs> forces of assimilation and acculturation were relatively weak. If you went to Warsaw in the 1930s, you would find that most of the non Hasidic middle class would be speaking Polish. You would find that most Jewish kids were already going to Polish schools. You would find that the fastest growing Jewish newspaper was the excellent daily paper of the Polish language national. But in Vilna, everybody spoke Polish. And so language, unlike other cities, did not divide the elites from the masses. And this fact helped lessen the distance between various social groups, and it facilitated the development of the communal ethos. 
There was a great poet, Moshe Kuba, who was shot by Stalin in 1937. He wrote a wonderful poem dedicated to Vilna. And the, and the lines go in part, you are a psalm spelled in clay and iron, spelled in prayer, a hymn that we walk, as the moon winking into ancient flames, glints in a naked and ugly cold splendor. And then he uh, ends the poem by saying, in Yiddish, is the first that comes in Denver, after the Rheingarten in Kreuzberg. And Yiddish is the oak, oak, oak leaf crown uh, on, on uh, the great entry gates to the city. So Kulbach defines Yiddish as that magical wand that turns a routine uh, holy city into a city of magic. So why did Yiddish play such a key role in this past? Can you all hear me? It, it's hard to believe that a hundred years ago, maybe a little bit more than a hundred years ago now, when a Jewish state seemed far off, there were 17 million Jews in the world, and 11 million of them still here. For centuries, this Yiddish language was both loved and despised. It was Mamelushan, and it was also Jargon, the babble spoken by servant girls and kids who worked in the tailor shop. It was certainly an expressive language. You could say you look like a million dollars in small change. <laughs> or, or you could say Sosyoshin a million dollars or South Spark and you inherit a million dollars and give it all to doctors <laughs> or pain fillers. Or you could say so but you at least found out it's saying so much like and we'd say that something. You may all your feet fall out and your teeth remain as a tooth. It was a language deeply suffused in Jewish spirit. Uh, if you were at a wedding and you didn't think the bride and the groom were going to stay married for very long. You could say, doesn't the women from Tommy Sesco who's pulling that'll last from the best of Esther's If you want to say that someone has an ulterior motive, you you uh, could say uh have had and the But nevertheless, it was a language that was despised. And then there was a writer in the mid 19th century, Sholem Abramovich, who was a genius, who would later gain fame under his pen name, Mendel and Western Support, who also helped to create the modern Hebrew literary writer. And at first, Mendel and Western Support wrote only in Hebrew. And when he began to write Yiddish, he confided that it felt like a vice that you don't like to talk about. Kind of like going to a bravo, no excuse me. And he used a pen name, maybe because he didn't want people to know. The first time the Yitzhak language parents wrote in Yiddish, he began with an apology. My lead both for Randosh Kikungen, and so far going Yiddish Zingen. Uh, and, and so on. My song would have sounded completely different had I sung it for Gentiles in their tongue and not for Jews and not in Yiddish. And then in the 1890s, a remarkable thing took place. Jargon became Yiddish. Writers like Shalom Aleichem, Yitzhak Leibich Paris, and Mendeleev 
who had apologized for writing in the dispatch line, were suddenly discovered that they could create works of literary beauty. And then one of these writers, Harris, had a vision. In the words of the poet Jakob von Gladstein, Harris created the Jewish 20th century. That's what Gladstein said. In Eastern Europe, Harris was that important. Today, we forgot long about it. But for the Jews living in Eastern Europe, he was very, very central. And for Paris, he had this vision that Yiddish would be the bridge that would link Jewish tradition and European humanism. Yiddish would bring the Jew into the modern world. The Jew could free him or herself from the dead hand of religious tradition without having to give up his Jewishness or his past. Yiddish literature would recycle the rich treasure of Hasidic and religious Jewish texts and turn them into a secular canon. A new country would take its place alongside others. And this new country would be called Yiddish Yiddish land. No borders, no police, no army, just millions of Jews around the world who loved Yiddish and whose new rich culture would gain the respect of their non-Jewish neighbors. Now, by definition, a country without police or an army can only function in a power and liberal world where nationalities can live in peace side by side. And this was Peretz's vision and his deep conviction. When the belt that Shena, Liebeck, Lesa, Sinek, the world will become a better place less hate and more love. Now, if there was ever really a Yiddish love, if Peretz's vision ever came close to reality, then one thing was absolutely certain, its capital was built. Warsaw had six times Vilnius Jewish population, but in the interwar period, more students studied in Yiddish schools in Vilna than in any other city in the world. Vilna had a Yiddish high school. Warsaw didn't. Just 40 years after Mendela swarmed an embarrassment for writing jargon, Vilna Jews had built the Yiddish, the Yiddish Scientific Institute, the Yiddish high school, the Real Gymnasium, and one of the final Jewish and one of the finest Jewish technical schools in the world, the Technical, where one had to pass the stiff exam in Yiddish to get in. There were Montessori schools in Yiddish. There were uh, crew teams, and, 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 and there were soccer games all played in the Yiddish. Vilna composed textbooks in physics and chemistry and mathematics, or expanded the vocabulary of the Yiddish language. There was a young Jewish soccer player, Razor Wolf, who bet that he could write a thousand Yiddish poems in one month, and he won his bet. That didn't uh, include the translation of Hiawatha, which you also translated into Yiddish and Persian reader. Years ago, I met a Buddhist, Arthur Lermer, in Montreal. And Arthur Lermer came from uh, Traffic, a city where most of the uh, Jews spoke Polish. Lermer arrived in Bill <coughs> to get into the technical. And his Yiddish wasn't quite good enough. Uh, he was uh, he was struggling, and so they were walking on the castle hill with Moshe Kovac and other students, and people were speaking Polish to make things easier. And then a group of Poles came along, and everybody switched into Yiddish. They didn't want the Poles to think they were ashamed of their language. And Lerber said, "Oh my God, in Krakow, it would have been just the opposite." It would have been just, just the, the opposite. And then there's the story of the Real Gymnasium had an acting troupe, and they went to Warsaw to play Julius Caesar, all in Yiddish. Shakespeare's doing the same. And uh, to, before the kids went, went on stage, Kubat told the kids, Give a feisty voucher of us to build that thing. Kids show these Warsaw Jews what Vilna kids can really do. <coughs> As Young 
by the way, I, I don't want to give the impression that Vilna was entirely monochrome. There was an Orthodox Vilna led by the famous rabbi, Chaim Moise Brzezinski, who died in 1940. There was a religious science Vilna uh, led by Rabbi Yitzhak Lutak. There was Zionist Vilna led by Yanka Kielutsky. There was a Bundes Vilna led by Rabbi Rosenthal. There was a great Hebrew high school, the Talbot Gymnasium, two of whose graduates, including Yitzhak Zipperman, the deputy commander of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and Abba Kovner, a commander of Vilna Partisan. So it's not that Vilna was a monotone city. It was a diverse city, like all Jewish cities in this world. But what made Vilna different was that it had a civic tradition, a tradition of, of, of civic dedication which made the Jews to overcome their political differences and work together in a way that they didn't work in other parts of Eastern Europe. As Nathan Schiff once remarked, Paris wrote in Warsaw, but he was read in Vilna. In the Vilna ghetto, there was standing room only to hear Zelda Kaminoch give a lecture series on Paris. And on Lagba Omer in 1942, the choir of the ghetto school declaimed the parrot's poem that uh, underscored a stubborn conviction in the eventual triumph of justice. Our tears will turn into rivers. <laughs> our rivers will turn into oceans. Our oceans will turn into a flood. Don't think that the world is a tavern without laws and without a judge. One year later, in September 1943, most of these children would die in the gas chambers of some people. But in the meantime, in the schools of the Dona Ghetto, they wrote poems. They organized a mock trial of Herod and Josephus. Jews who had collaborated with the Romans, a mock trial of Bar Kokhba, who led a seemingly hopeless revolt against the Romans, figures in Jewish history whose own dilemmas illustrated the terrible challenges of life in the ghetto. These were remarkable kids, the last gasp of Jewish government. Two of those kids survived. Uh, one, uh, survived in the building together, became a world famous uh, artist. His, his name would be Samuel Bach. Another was Benjamin Harshav, who became a world famous professor of literature at Yale University. So, what made this world of Jewish buildings so different, so unique? So, let me just take a brief historical excursion. First, remember that Vilna was a multinational city, a spectacular kaleidoscope of competing memories of swirling imagined cities in a prism of lakes and pine forests and time. And all that was the Palladium. <coughs> imagined cities in the film. For Yerushalayim the Lita, the Jerusalem of Lithuania, was also Vilnius to the Lithuanian, and that's what it is now, and Vilna to the Pope. And let's not forget the Belarusians, with their Vilnia. Imagine a Boston that is also Bastonius, Bastonsky, Bastonovic, Bastono. And then the Jews come along and say, no, it's the Ushalayim of Massachusetts. <laughs> For the Lithuanians, it was their ancient capital, where Prince Gedeminas fell asleep and had a dream of wolves on a hill and founded his castle there. That castle hill, the castle still said Sam, that castle hill was one of the most beautiful sites in the city. You could see the whole town from it. It was a great place to walk. And as you descended from the hill, you reached the main street of Vilna, whose many different names gave you a sense of Vilna's history. Under the Russians, it was various Prospect. Under the Poles, it was Mitzkevich Avenue. Now, under the Lithuanians, guess what? It's 
Gedimilus happened. One of Gedimilus' descendants, King Yagyelo, married a Polish princess, Yadviga, who became a Christian in 1561. Poland and Lithuania came together to form the Gedimilus, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. And this lasted until the Russian takeover in 1795. So during the course of the 16th and 17th century, Vilnius divided into Vilna, the Polish Vilna. It was an Italianate jewel of churches, monasteries, convents, Jesuit schools, the icon of, of the uh, Ustra Brahma, which were Poles, is, together with the Black Madonna, Chensakova, the two Kosovo Maravis, the two Daily Walls. And generations of Poles who come to know that the pray in Nido in front of the Blessed Virgin. It was in Vilna that the Poles built their great university, the Stefan Bator University, which they saw as the great bulwark of Western culture against the Russians. And over time, the Lithuanian nobility adopted not just the Catholic faith, but Polish culture. But many still saw themselves not as Poles, but as Polish-speaking Lithuanians, like Adam Mickiewicz, Poland's greatest poet, Josef Pilsudski, the father of modern Poland, Czesław Miło, a Polish writer who got the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1984. And Miłosz wrote an amazing memoir of Dilma called Native Realm, in which she pointed out that neat definitions never fit Lithuania. Because for Westerners who like nations to be well-defined and well-packaged and easily understood, a careful reading of Miłosz is essential. Because how else can an outsider understand how Poland's national epic, Poland's national poem, the poem that every Polish high school student has to study and memorize big chunks of Pan Tadeusz begins with the following words, O Lithuania, my fatherland. Now, <clears throat> you, you go figure that out. O Lithuania, my fatherland. Polish Lithuania was gone, as Mitzkevich was writing this. Poland was gone. When will it come, when will it come back again? When will we see it again? And Mitzkevich writes, O oh, Lithuania, my country, you're like good health. I never knew till now how precious you were till I lost you. Now I see how beautiful you are because I miss you so much. Mitzkevich's heart was breaking because of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth was born. For Czesław Miłosz, Vilna became like Atlantis, a lost continent sunk under the ocean. And as Ruth Weiss has pointed out, there is a fascinating similarity in the metaphors the two great Vilna poets use for their lost city. Miłosz uses Atlantis, and Avram Sutzka, the great, great Yiddish poet, who lived half a mile from Miłosz before the war, but they could have lived on Mars because Poles and Jews had little, they shared little in common. Avram Sutzkever compared Jewish Vilna, the Oshalan Velika that was so terribly destroyed, to a green aquarium, a green aquarium. And through glass and green water, you can see people, the Jewish Vilna that was, you want to come closer. You want to touch the glass. You want to break it. You want to bring it back. You want to touch it. But if you break the glass, it all falls apart. It can live only in memory. Now, <laughs> what was Lita, Jewish Lithuanian? And the only people that Lita means anything to is us, not to the Poles and not to the Lithuanians. Jewish Lita is not to be confused with the present-day Lithuanian state. Lita included a vast area, the old Lithuanian of Grand Duchy of the 16th century, that today would be Lithuania, Belarus, Northeast Poland, and a good chunk of Ukraine. 
And with that, the Jews spoke their own particular Yiddish. And it was a Yiddish that differed not just in pronunciation from other Yiddish dialects, but even in the grammar. For example, in Litvak Yiddish, you don't have das, das kin, das samedo. Uh, there, there are other differences, too. Litvak Yiddish has become the part of many jokes, but I'll spare you that. But it's interesting that the boundary between Litvak and Polish Yiddish, the, the dialect lines run across the old 16th century border. So the Napton Begum came from a, a, a list on the east side of the Big River, which was Lithuania in the 16th century. He spoke Litvak Yiddish. You went 10 miles to the west on the other side of the river, and it was Polish Yiddish. Here's a true story. In 1920, there were negotiations taking place between two newly born states, the Lithuanian Republic and the Soviet Union. And two Jews were handling the negotiations. Yes, those things happened then. Yotta for the Soviet Union and Soloveitchik for Lithuania. And they were trying to hammer out their mutual borders. And uh, so, Soloveitchik said, I have a proposal. Lithuania should include all the territories where Jews say kugel instead of kibble. <laughs> yeah. That would have made for an enormous, enormous Lithuanian state, including Bialystok, including Novogrudek or Navarro, including North Ukraine, including Vince and uh, Vitebsk, but it was not the big. Now, as you know, the Litvaks developed their own culture and one that differed in many essential respects from the other Jewish tribes of Eastern Europe. And the relations between the Litvaks and the other Jewish tribes were not always marked by unstinking love and mutual affection. Uh, there would be a story that a Warsaw Jew would say, oh yeah, look, I just saw a policeman and he arrested two Litvaks and a Jew. <laughs> or uh, the Polish Jews were called the Litvox sailing death the crosses because they were supposedly less observant. The Litvox would respond, that's when the Christian would cut me back off and you don't have to kiss me on my forehead. You'll remember Paris's story, If Not Higher. It's a short story that many of you may have read. And the Nevin of her rabbit disappears before he goes into the road. And people want to know where he's going. And this Hasidic follower saying, oh, he's going to, to the heaven and spheres. He's, he's interceding for us poor Jews. And the Lindbar has no use for this part of the And he's determined to find out what's really going on. He hides under the Rebbe's bed. And uh, because he's a Lindbar, he doesn't want to waste time. So he studies a page of Talmud while he's hiding under uh, the bed. <laughs> and then he follows the memory of the Rebbe. He sees that the Rebbe dresses up like a peasant. He chops wood for an old woman. He likes the furnace. And the Litvak ends his skepticism, his, his arid doubting, uh, uh, and he becomes a uh, prophet and a disciple of the Rebbe. But as you can tell from, from this, a major difference between the Litvox and the Polish Jews was religion. In the 18th century, classicism, the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, although some scholars are not going to get into that, basically classicism spread like wildfire from the Litzia, Bolin, and Poland. And Hasidism had a powerful and optimistic religious message. You can find joy. You can find that vacancy. You can cleave to God. You can pray with true emotion. Uh, you have to get into the mood with the nigger, maybe with a little bit of alcohol, with the dance. You find a sad, you can find a rebbe that you can trust, that you can rely on, and it'll, and it'll help you go higher and higher. The rebbe is a charismatic religious leader, 
And Hasid is the mark, the soul of much of Polish Jewry. It set the rhythm of much of Polish Jewish life. The folk, the traveling to the Rebbe, the trading stories about the Rebbe, spending days on end at the Rebbe, singing, eating, dancing with other Hasidim. And uh, many Litvak saw this as absolutely irresponsible. What do you mean you leave your wife for Pesach and you go see the Rebbe? Who heard of such a thing? And look at these little Hasidim left, the Babel de you know, they're dancing around and they're prancing around. Look at them. They're, and, and, and so the Litvaks made up many songs making fun of the Hasidim. Like there was one song that, 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 that let me see if I can remember this. Uh, which means a person is saying, Oh, you, you, you invented a steamship and you can cross it. You, know, you, you think that's a big deal? When our Rebbe wants to cross the ocean, just takes out his handkerchief and he spreads it out and he crosses the ocean. And of course, that was an example of the contempt that men felt for the Hasidic. Uh, and it was largely because of, of the Grah, the Vilna Gaon, that Hasidism failed to penetrate much of the Ukraine. It did make inroads in White Russia, Chabad, Karmen, Stalin, but in, in central Lithuania, Hasidism was very, very weak. And that had an enormous consequence. Because if Hasidism expressed the importance of personal charisma, your personal relationship with the Rebbe, your personal relationship with other Hasidim, uh, your Bitochim, your, your faith, the Litvak Jewish ethos stressed impersonal charisma. The charisma of doing what you have to do for the community. Whereas in Polish, in the Polish shadow, the community might be divided into different Hasidic shtibbles. And the local doctors and the local middle class people might be speaking Polish and reading it instead. Uh, but in Lithuania, you had much less of a social distance. The disciples of the Vilna God created, as I said, the Lithuanian yeshiva to train a new and the graduates of those yeshivas and the leaders of Lithuanian Jewry put the wider community first. In Lithuania, what reigned supreme was a sense of communal responsibility that included everyone. And out of this tradition comes the Roman civil society, what I'm talking about. Because Hasidism failed to penetrate Lithuania, Lithuanian Jewry, the Litvaks, were much more open to modern teaching, the science, the secular studies. The Litvaks were much more open to modernization. Uh, the modernization of Litvak Jewry happened uh, gradually, and it happened in an organic way. It happened in a way that was able to find Jewish values for secular values. And that explains why it was Jewish Lithuania that was the real cradle of the hood, and that was the real cradle of Zionist movements that then spread else, uh, elsewhere. And something else, in those areas where Hasidism was very strong, Jewish uh, members of the Jewish middle class, Jewish university class, Jewish high school graduates tended to look at the Hasidic class because a certain degree of contempt, a certain distance. In Lithuania, as I said, the educated and the uneducated did not have that same distance. Now, another very important point. Lithuania and Jewry lived in a very different milieu from Polish Jewry. Most of the Gentiles that Lithuanian Jews lived among, and I probably include most of your grandparents, were Lithuanian peasants or white Russian peasants. And their languages and cultures had no attraction or for Jews. 
whereas Jews of Marcel, Krakow, and Paul, even worse, would be living among the people, the Poles, who had an enormously attractive culture. And so, whereas in Polish Jewry, there was a plague of what I would call wannabeism, that even when Jews felt proud that they were Jews, very often there was a certain hankering to be accepted by the whole, to be accepted by this great nation that they lived side by side with. In Lithuanian Jewish culture, you didn't have that wannabeism. Uh, Polish culture was never really attractive to Lithuanian Jewry because the Poles were suppressed by the Russians after 1863. And so educated Lithuanian Jews before World War I chose Russian culture as their high culture, as their bridge to Europe. But the problem was that there were very few Russians in Lithuania, very few. And so you might speak Russian at home, but there was no real possibility of assimilation. And that meant that Lithuanian Jewry really lacked an assimilationist option. There was nobody to assimilate to. And that's why the Haskalah, the Enlightenment in Lithuania, modern Jewish politics in Lithuania, the intellectual transformations of the Jewish Litvox, all this was done in a Jewish register, was done in a Jewish dimension. After World War I, when the Lithuanians and the Poles fought over the uh, it behooved the Jews, one, not to speak Russian, because that would end with everybody, and two, not to take sides, and that made them even more eager to stress we're Jewish, our language is Yiddish, we're neither Polish nor Lithuanian, and we're not involved in these disputes. The tension between Jews and Poles began as soon as World War I was over. The Poles took Vilna on April 19, 1990. And for Poles, even to this day, April 19 was seen as a great holiday. The Vizvalenia Vilna, the liberation of Vilna. Well, Jews remember it very differently because it was on that day that the Polish army uh, organized the Patron where 55 Jews were murdered, including a beloved Yiddish writer named Alex Weiter. Uh, the Viper's uh, <laughs> murder shocked Vilna Jewry, and the Jews wanted to erect a memorial in the Vilna Jewish cemetery, but the Poles didn't want it. And so they finally erected the figure of a large eagle with one wing cut off. And uh, it was touch and go for a long time whether the Polish authorities would allow this. But it meant that every year, on April 19th, the Poles celebrated the liberation of their city, and the Jews remembered the Polish public. Interwar Vilna was perceived as a city with shared rules and norms of conduct, and a city that fostered Jewish moral solidarity. Long after the Holocaust, a Jewish writer named Avram Karpinovich published two short stories about life in Vilna between the wars. And a lot of these stories, uh, two books of short stories, and a lot of these stories had to do with the Vilna underworld. Vilna had, thank God, a good Jewish uh, underworld. I mentioned in the talk I gave to Joburg and Marshall. There was a shoulder of the Gensha Cemetery, frequented by the pickpockets, our first shoulder, and uh, usually when you say the shrine, you don't arise, but when the pickpocket shoulder, you have your eyes open. Uh, and according to Carter Novick, the uh, safe crackers in Vilna had a show where the motto over the grave on the Prophets, the cover and the cover was stop shoving the coffin, open the gates with wisdom. <laughs> and this was the bottom that the safe crackers uh, adopted. But there's one story that I'd like to cite for you. 
It's called meat part of building. We don't do this in building. And it comes as follows. Smaller Dutke was a builder crook who went to the United States, got caught in a holdout and was sentenced to citizen and temporary. After he did his 10 year sentence, he was reported back to Poland. And he calls his old builder friends in a cry. Ellie Bell left their custom and Schmuel and his Boschi and asked that they would be building all crooks. And this is around the time of the Lindbergh uh, uh, kidnapping in 1932. And so Smaller Dutka <coughs> proposes that they kidnap the seven year old son of a wealthy builder Jew, Budi Bosch. And they'll get a big ransom for him. So they kidnap the kid and they tell Buni Lovich to leave the ransom under the landmark, the tomb of the Gansenek in the Jewish cemetery. But the builder crooks immediately experience terrible feelings of guilt. Esther can be brilliant, she has to take care of the kid. And she stuffs him with food and hot chocolate. She tells him not to walk around barefoot and all that story. The father of the boy does not leave the ransom in the tomb of the Garrett Senate, but Esther decides to let the boy go because he starts to cry for his parents. Smoladuke is furious, but the builder crooks support Esther, and the story ends as follows. Maybe you do such things in the United States, they tell Smoladuke. This is not what's going to be built. One of the most critical characteristics of Jewish Dona was the leadership of its Jewish lawyers and Jewish doctors, its professional elites. This was an elite that, as I said, had spoken Russian before the war. And going over to the Yiddish in the 20s and 30s. This was an elite that had been largely trained in Russian universities. And they had that ethos of the old Russian intelligentsia. And they brought together the traditions of the Russian intelligentsia to serve the people before yourself with the traditions of the Indian Jews. And these professionals, people like Samak Shabbat, and Dr. Dante Vygotsky, these were the great leaders of Jewish culture. Joseph Chetnik, a lawyer. These were not just doctors and lawyers, these were people that the whole community looked up to and went to in a time of, of trouble. And they created a, a culture of social responsibility and personal accountability. In Russian, there's a term called the philosophy of small beings. For radicals like Lenin, or Stalin, that term came to have a pejorative meaning. Why build a co-op? Why build a school or a clinic so you can have a revolution and knock everything down? And in Vilna, there were certainly things <coughs> revolutionaries, but no one stuck at small groups. It was the very life of the community. I want to end this by recommending that you all read a book by Lucy Tabuda. It was a book that she wrote about the year she spent in Vilna in 1938 1939 at the Eagle. And it's a fabulous book. And she describes the good times going to the Eagle for the first time in New York. Yiddish institutions were always cluttered, they were crowded, they were on the fourth floor. The Yivo was like a, a little palace of order at the center of scholarship. The message of the Yivo was Yiddish has arrived. Yiddish deserves to travel first class. She was very taken by that. She met young Yiddish writers and poets like Sutzkever and Nagrata, uh, long evenings at Belfit Cafe, going to the theater to see the Tempest in uh, Yiddish. She heard Aida in Yiddish, although she did convince them to perform and see the message a bit better than the Dona performance. But at the same time, she wondered whether the Dona Jews would hold out. 
Polish anti-Semitism has been worse and worse. Uh, Jews were being boycotted. The poverty was getting worse. And she asked herself, how long can they hold on? But she also recorded other voices. Max Feinlein, the director of the Evil, the School of Optimism. He was going ahead to plans for the Evo Conference in 1940. There was a medical conference that had taken place. A Jewish doctor got up on the roster and urged Jewish women to have more babies. Absolutism for the sun and just despite our enemies. At a Yiddish school in Vilna, just one week before the start of the school year, the Polish authorities suddenly confiscated all the desks and chairs in the school on some uh, pretext. And working day and night, Jewish parents cobbled together enough tables and desks to enable the classes to be And this is what Vilna meant that you don't knock it on you, you don't give in, you don't let them get you down, you keep fighting. And this is why in 1939, more than ever, Vilna was seen as a model for the Jewish diaspora. I want to end this talk by reading a poem, sorry, by reading a poem composed by my favorite Yiddish poet. This was composed in the Vilna Ghetto of 1943. And since so we're back dated this, to the day when the Vilna artists left the ghetto to go into the forest. And why they did that is the subject of those two or three other lectures. And he entitles this poem, The Lead Plates at the Rome Press. He's lying the blossom in the home to get up. The Rome Press have been the press in Vilna that have provided generations of Jews with the Vilna Vision of the Talmud and many other books inside. And it symbolized Vilna's central role in Jewish culture and Vilna's central role in Jewish continuity. Now this poem is about Jewish continuity. It has the images of three places, Jerusalem, Babylonia, where the Talmud was composed and built. And the poem is about something which didn't really happen, but which Sister would say happened symbolically. That is that the build of fighters in the ghetto melted the lead plates that had been used to make the build of shots, the build of Talmud, and they melted them into bullets so they could fight. And this is an extraordinary poem which captures the place of Jewish Vilna and for Sutzkever, which marks the end of Jewish Vilna. And I'll read this first in Yiddish and then in English. Wir wollen die Kinder gestreckte durch Graten zu fangen die Wüste der Luft und der Frei. Durch Nachse gezeigen zu nehmen die Platten, die kleine Platten von sonst und der Rei, die mit Grüne und Arten des Berner Soldaten und schmelzen nach Teer und dem Geist und dem Blau. Und wir haben wieder der mit dem Stempel, seit das Heimische Heide der Heer, die Schottens verpanzert, wahrscheinlich von der Lente und die Dost in die Ostes, erzählen und erzählen. Als er wie die Seele des Amorien im Tempel, die Gilde in der Lente zu mehr, das der Meer, das bleibt die Leuchten, dann müssen wir es nicht holen, nach Schottens zu danken, an uns zu verloren, das Schöne von Bordel, das Schöne von Feuern. Wir sollten geplänzt in der Seite der Moss, die hier schon wurde, in der Welt verheilen, die so dreißig ist, dass wir da nicht verschlafen. Und der Welt sollte die Erde der Gesellschaft, das kann sein, war Klarheit mit heldischen jüdischen Händen. Wir sehen halt der Randlands auf ihre Schade, das Fallen von jeder Kanäten der Welt. Dann wurden die Werte verschmolzen in Bäumen, in sehr stimmen im Herzen der Welt. Morgen die Dinge von der Translation. A rain at night, like fingers stretched through bars, to clutch the lit air of freedom. We made for the press plates, the seas, the lead plates at the wrong printing works. We were dreamers, we had to be soldiers, and knelt down for our bullets, the spirit, the spirit of the lead. At some timeless native layer, we unlocked the seal once more 
shrouded in shadow by the glow of the lamp, like temple ancients dipping oil into candelabrum to festal gold. So pouring out wine after lettered wine is wheat. Letter by melting letter the lead, liquefied bullets, gleams with thoughts. A verse from Babylon, a verse from Poland, seething, flowing into the one mold. Now must Jewish grip, long concealed in words, that make the world of a shot. Who in Bill Maghetto has beheld the hands of Jewish heroes clasping weapons? Has beheld Jerusalem in its throes, the crumbling of those granite walls, grasping the words melted into lead, counting their sounds? Ladies and gentlemen, I know that uh, some of you are going to try and get to the symphony concert this evening, but uh, before you go, if you can just hang on one minute. Um, just to say that I think that the vast canvas that you've painted for us at the Kassoff this evening, rich and full and just beautifully illustrated in all your ability to bring in the Yiddish for us, has really given us, in a sense, the history of our own origins and the richness of our own origins. And it, for me, is bittersweet because Having gone to Vilnius, just Vilna, beautiful city, so rich in culture and architecture and everything, and the threads of Jewish history going through it, your portrait is just an incredibly sad because obviously it's not there anymore. And for people like yourself, scholars like yourself, people with your own history, to bring it back to us like this is really truly remarkable. And I thank you for it indeed. Thank you very much. I know that some of you have to go, so I'm going to let those that want to stay just move a little forward because Dr. Kassoff has kindly agreed to answer some questions. And um, I will bring the mic to you if you would like me to bring it to you. Just so please just indicate your hands. Um, those of you that have come, thank you very much indeed for being with us this evening that have to go. But for the others, I would like to uh, offer you the opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, poor lands around the Baltic. 
Now, the old duchy of Lithuania uh, was a multi-ethnic area. And it was an area where the peasants spoke different languages. They spoke, you know, would be an anachronism to say they spoke Belarusian or Lithuanian. They spoke the, 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 uh, the precursors of those languages. Uh, the, novi the, the, the official language of the old Grand Duke of Lithuania was actually an old Belarusian and uh, uh, then when it became part of the Polish Commonwealth, Polish became the language of culture, the language of education. It became the language used by the nobility. Uh, Latin was taught in, in all of the Catholic schools. Uh, Lithuanian more and more became the peasant language, the language of the peasants. That said, if your ancestors are from Lithuania, uh, the, the people that your grandparents would have been in contact with would have been those peasants. Had they been in contact with the landlords, uh, they might have spoken Polish. But keep in mind that in 1863, the Polish nobility was decimated by the Russians. After the unsuccessful revolt, many of the Polish nobles of Lithuania were hanged or exiled to Siberia. And then in the late 19th century, you began to have a Lithuanian revival. And you, and you have the birth of the modern literary Lithuanian language. Uh, and for some time, relations between Jews and this new Lithuanian national movement were, were good. Uh, in fact, in the dispute between the Lithuanians and the Poles over Vilnius, which came to fighting, and the Poles finally took it by force, by and large, without making an official stance, most Jews supported Lithuania, because they saw Lithuania as a weak people, as a people of many nationalities, and therefore it's less of a threat to that, whereas they saw the Poles as real anti-Semites. And Lithuanian Jewish relations weren't the worst. They weren't that bad until uh, the late 1930s. And even then, they were better than in Poland. Now, in the 20s and 30s, a new generation of grew up in Lithuania, Jews, who, went to, who learned Lithuanian. They had to. They served in the army. They had to go to university and school. But what was amazing was that if you, you know, in club now, in uh, in Shavu, uh, in Punivis, uh, Jews spoke Yiddish among themselves. They didn't speak Lithuanian. Very, very few exceptions. Hardly any exceptions. And, 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 and so this was a, a, a hallmark of the Lithuanian Jews. Well, it was, a, it was considered to be a weak people with a weak culture. I want to just bring this back to, to Merlin, because I think Merlin would have loved to know. And Merlin's majesty and his majestic personality and death and rage. So I'm not going to bring in the first of not only what to describe, but also the majestic sweep of our time to describe it. And just in memory of Merlin, and I only really want to thank the court, it's a good moment. But in memory of Merlin, I want to ask you, you give us a letter to Mark from Daniels, what your sense is of the country? Well, my my knowledge, my my knowledge of of, 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 of South Africa is uh, really comes mainly from the many South Africans who I know in the United States who mm -hmm. have settled in Hartford and New Haven and so on. And I see them as as kindred spirits. Uh, I recognize them. Uh, I, I, they're, they're the products of Lithuanian Jew, uh, that, that great uh, Jewish uh, loyalty, uh, that obligation to be part of the community, uh, this idea that uh, communal service is an obligation. Uh, I, 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 I don't know what's going on within South Africa today, but 
from what I read from the, uh, the fact that this community is so uh, 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 ready to help Israel, uh, that this community uh, developed the magnificent system of Jewish education, that developed the system of Jewish government, uh, that, you know, that that's a direct configuration, I, I think, of what Jews took with them from the Palladium. I'm not sure if this has been predominantly a Hungarian Jewish community or a German Jewish community would have had that same kind of tradition. It would have been good tradition, but they would have been different. Now, obviously, I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm an outsider. Uh, you know, clearly this country is not having easy history, and the Jews are not totally masters of their own faith. It's a religion to tell us. In, in the diaspora, sometimes that's happening in the sometimes the body, but that was not the body. And I leave that to you to kind of thing. Uh, but that's as far as I go. <laughs> Um, my grandmother graduated from what was called the school to today, so she had some membership in the school. Uh, but I just want to be what language you play with it. Then it's a very important language to be 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 a very important language to uh, probably Russian and Hebrew tradition uh, at, at school. Or when you begin to have modern Jewish schools, or the organized after 1905. Uh, but if you went to a gymnasium around 1900, the language of instruction would be. Well, just uh, leads me to. Thank you all for coming this evening. Thank you to the Smith family for affording us this opportunity. And thank you, Dr. Kassel, for your magnificent address. Thank you very much.